Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. We have been on a long trip through the Bible and then a very short trip through the Bible, which is about to come to an end. This session, we're going to start uh, in the last book of the Bible. So take your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation, and let's start at the very beginning. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things that must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. That's quite an introduction to a very controversial book, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, there's many things that we need to say sort of at the beginning of looking at Revelation. Part of it is because in some Bibles it's not called, called Revelation at all. In Roman Catholic Bibles it's called Apocalypse, which many people confuse with Apocrypha. It's not Apocrypha. Apocrypha means hidden or, or somehow concealed. Apocalypse means revealed or revelation. It means open. So whereas the book of Daniel, which is in some ways similar to the book of Revelation, uh, has many links with Revelation, Daniel says at the end of his book that things are sealed up. The book of Revelation is a chance, as we will see, to open up everything and to try to this is God's effort to try to explain what's going to happen in the future. Now we need to be honest right up front. There are three very different views about how, in general, how to interpret the book of Revelation. Some people think, many critical scholars think, that the book of Revelation, since they don't believe God can predict the future, that somehow or other the entire book of Revelation has to be focused on things that are going on in John's day. Um, we don't happen to agree with that. There are others who think it's the, the revelations here are so fanciful and so otherworldly in a sense that um, they certainly can't possibly happen until some long time in the future. And they want to put everything in the book of Revelation far off into the future still. Seventh-day Adventists in general have taken the attitude that the book of Revelation it was intended by God not, as an, not only as an encouragement to the people in John's day, but as a, a, a sort of layout. We believe God can predict the future, and he laid out that picture in several different sort of layers, if you will, uh, starting from the days of John all the way to the second coming, and then at the end, on to the third coming and the, and the building or, or recreating uh, of, of the new earth in the form of the Garden of Eden. Ken? Is there something that is mysterious about that first verse that I read? Because in the middle of it, it says, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Yeah. Now, is there something in Greek that makes that mysterious, that no. this is... No. Is but of course, shortly come to pass, some would say, okay, that's in the next 15 or 20 years, and it all happened then. That's the way some would interpret it. Um, or, or if it didn't come to pass, then uh, maybe there's, it has nothing to, uh, no, of no value. Yeah. So or, or at least necessary. if it came to, we ought to be able to identify the things that came to pass that are fulfilled by this, or we're still waiting for it. Yeah. Well, okay, so why was the book written? Um, 
we're going to go through some of the issues involved here. Um, first of all, who wrote it? Um, most scholars agree that this was written by the Apostle John. This would have been written very near the end of his life. Probably the Gospel of John and the three letters are written after Revelation was written. Revelation was written from the small, tiny, little, almost rock, well, the rocky outcrop in the middle of the Aegean Sea called the island of Patmos, where, son, where, where John had been exiled um, to try to prevent him from spreading any Christianity. And apparently God appeared to him there. And yes. Is there anything in other writings that says that that was a place where a lot of people got exiled who were not wanted by the government? Yes. Or was he there all by himself? No, no, there were other people there, mm -hmm. definitely. And yes, there are a lot of comments about John's being there and about why he was there in what we call the early church fathers. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll look at some of those very quickly. How old um, was John when he was on this island? We, of course, don't, can't know exactly, but close to 100 years old. And so then John went on to write uh, the book of John and the three letters after that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he, he was prolific when he was very aged. Okay. Um, he didn't do any writing in his early years for whatever reason, and maybe he had some help at the end. Um, just a parting, just a, just a passing comment. Um, the Greek in the book of Revelation is probably the poorest Greek in the New Testament. Um, some people, some scholars jokingly comment that Maybe the secretarial help on the Isle of Patmos wasn't, Patmos wasn't very good. <laughs> did John know Greek? Yeah, well, presumably. Yeah, we, there's pretty good evidence he did. I mean, I, you know, there's a remote possibility that uh, he had someone helping him who, you know, in all of his writing, you know, it, the, Greek, the Greek in the Gospel of John is where everybody starts learning Greek. It's simple, it's straightforward, it's beautiful Greek. And then Revelation is like this, so people have to assume that it depended upon the amount of help he had when writing those, different, those two different books. But he was a fisherman, so he didn't have that much education. He wasn't like, um, like a Paul. Paul. He was or, not or Paul. Luke. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. So this could have been his own stumbling Greek. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It could be. Um, there are five times in the book. Uh, that would be verse one, chapter 1, verse 1, verse 4, and verse 9. And then at the end, chapter 21, verse 2, and 22, verse 8, where he just says, I, John, or this is written by John, or something like that. So he claims right up front that he is the one who wrote it. Now, there are people who believe that this couldn't have been the, the disciple John. It must be some other John. Um, and... There's not much support evidence for, for that kind of an idea. That's a, sort of like a red, red herring. Um, there are people who, who were uh, immediate successors to John, who learned from John, who passed on to their friends that, yes, John was the one who wrote this book. Um, so that's all pretty good. Um, who was it written to? The, the book was written to uh, churches in, on the, in the, what we call today Asia Minor, well, I mean, what's called in those days Asia Minor, what we would call today Turkey. Um, those churches were established by whom? Oh. Paul. And so it's quite certain that since he, he talks about, he's writing instruction to these churches like someone who's more or less in charge, someone in authority, it's almost certain, in light of that, that he would not have written like that if Paul had still been alive. So if Paul was uh, beheaded in around 67 AD, this means this book couldn't have been written before that date. Um, so that gives us a little clue. Uh, most people agree that this was probably written somewhere. Um, well, Domitian, who was the, the second major emperor to persecute Christians, reigned from 81 A.D. to 96 A.D. And it's believed by most, at least the conservative scholars, that Revelation would be have written somewhere near the end of Domitian's reign. Domitian would be the one who, who and there's 
ancient evidence to support the idea that Domitian is the one who, who put John on the Isle of Patmos, and then that when Nerva, his follower, uh, tried to reverse a lot of the nonsense that Domitian had done, he released people, apparently everybody, from the Isle of Patmos, and John was able to go back to Ephesus, which was probably his home for a long period of time, and he wrote the three epistles and the Gospel of John at that point in time. Um, it's interesting to note there's, there's considerable evidence from different sorts, different places. Let me read you just these few words from Ellen White. When John was arrested for being a Christian, and I'm quoting now from, uh, I'll read you two or three paragraphs from Acts of the Apostles, page five, 569, 570. John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. They surely thought that would take care of him, right? But the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. I mean, imagine being thrown into a pot of boiling oil. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John declared, my master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. These words had their influence, and John was removed from the cauldron by the very men who had cast him in. Again, the hand of persecution fell heavily upon the apostle. By the emperor's decree, John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, condemned, quote, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1.9. Here his enemies thought his influence would no longer be felt, and he must finally die of hardship and distress. And what was the result? Revelation. <laughs> the book of Revelation. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. And, you know, it's not just Ellen White that, that mentions that. Um, way back in Tertullian, way back sometime, between, well, probably around the year 200 A.D., said, um, uh, let me just see, where Paul endures a passion like his Lord's, where P Paul wins his crown in a death like John the Baptist, where the Apostle John was first plunged unhurt into boiling oil and thence remitted to his island exile. So that's a testimony of someone right there almost old enough to know John. Um, and there are many other references to suggest that. Um, now, one of the things that we will want, to, we're, we're just taking a very brief overall look at some of the unique features of the book of Revelation. It's the only book in the Bible that mentions the millennium or a third coming of Christ. Or second death. Or the second death, for that matter, yes. And there's other places in the Bible that imply things that we would call maybe the second death, but they don't use that term. War right? in heaven? Yeah. War in heaven? Yeah, Revelation 12. Is the third coming of Christ when he comes down with the new Jerusalem? Yes. That's yes. the third, considered the third coming? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, one of the most prominent features of the book of Revelation is the presentation of satanic counterfeits that oppose God in a spiritual war of cosmic proportions. And I don't think I need to tell any of you, but let's we'll look at some of those. It's very clear that through at least the central part of the book, there is both sides presented, back and forth. Satan's side, God's side, Satan's side, God's side. And that's a very interesting and unique aspect of the book of Revelation. Let me just mention some of those interesting co contrasts. The beast is an image to, of Satan, whom Satan brought forth, Revelation 13, 1, just as Christ is the exact image of God, begotten by the Father, Psalm 2, 7, Colossians 1, 15, and Hebrews 1, 3. <coughs> so we have both sides with a power and then an image. The beast has ten horns and blasphemous names, Revelation 13, 1. Christ has many crowns and worthy names, Revelation 19, 12. The dragon gave the beast his power, throne, and great authority, Revelation 13, 2. Just as Christ has power, Revelation 5, 12, and 13, throne, Revelation 3, 21, and authority, Revelation 12, 10, from the Father, John 5, 21 to 23. The beast has a seemingly fatal wound from which he was recovered, which he has recovered, Revelation 13, 3. 
counterfeiting, counterfeiting Christ's resurrection, and the beast's recovery is one of the principal features that attracts followers, Revelation 13, 4, just as the resurrection of Christ is one of the principal points of evangelistic proclamation. And you can see is, how many comparisons there are here. Is the book of Revelation the one place <coughs> that really shows Satan as the great impersonator? Whatever Christ tries to do, Satan tries to do. Yes. And that's really um, one of the pointed more in the book of Revelation than any other book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It also mentioned Michael and his angels, mm -hmm. a reference to the dragon and his angels, yeah. and back and forth. Satan has his demons. and mm -hmm. okay. Going on with my list, that's, I still have quite a few more things. The worship is directed both to the dragon and to the beast, Revelation 13, 4, just as Christians worship both the Father and the Son, John 5, 23. The beast attracts the worship of the whole world, Revelation 13, 7, just as Christ was, will, will be worshipped universally. The beast utters blasphemies, Revelation 13, 5, while Christ utters the, pra the praises of God, Hebrews 2, 12. The beast makes war against the saints, Revelation 13, 7, while Christ makes war against the beast, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. The song of praise to the beast in Revelation 13, 4 counterfeits the song to God in Exodus 15, 11. Is it telling us we're going to have a choice of going the beast yes. way or Christ's way? So that's our choice also. Yeah. After that list, it makes it pretty apparent that we need to identify the beast. Yeah. And we will certainly do that. Exactly. Well, we know some things about him already, don't we? He's empowered by the dragon. The dragon. Yeah. So who's Satan. is clearly identified as Satan himself. Right. And he will have many followers at some point in the future, presumably. Virtually everyone in this wor world will be following him. So... That gives us some clues already. And yeah. Christ uses different tactics in, in his war against Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan uses lies and deception, mm -hmm. and God, God and Jesus use truth. uses truth. And, and it's in love. It's, in other words, he, he, he lets it things, this adversary, the devil, Satan, demonstrate how bad he really is. Yeah. And it takes time, a long time, to really run that thing out to the yeah. fruition. Well, when it was first written, this book was almost certainly intended by God and John as a message of hope to the persecuted Christians in Asia Minor. Now, we haven't had a chance to look at the book really yet. What do you suppose about the book of Revelation, as, as, as you know it, would be a, a message of hope to those seven churches that John wrote to? Well, if you get to the last of it, it turns out okay. <laughs> okay? Well, what we see, and again, let me just emphasize what Norma's just said. Basically, we see a church and really stepping back further in history, the people of God, the Israelites for many years, and now the church coming on uh, have gone th are going to go through really, really difficult times. But the point is, it's going to emerge victorious. And it's going to do so by complete and total dependence upon Jesus Christ, who is the leader, who is the one who ultimately really conquered the devil. So... Very, very important point. How the, could these churches think of this book as hope if they didn't believe that God pr could predict the future? Yeah. Because the book says in the future God's going to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear, isn't it, that Revelation 21, 22 haven't happened yet. Yeah. We're not living in a new heaven and a new earth. Um, so... It, you know, I, I don't see how people can say this is all. I don't know what they, I, I guess maybe they say that the new heaven and the new earth is after the Roman Empire is gone or who, I don't know. I just don't understand that. Even but. those that don't like the book want things to turn out well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it turns out, and we will mention more about this in the future, that the book of Revelation is designed like a big, we would call it a V, the, uh, the ancient Greeks called a chiasm because uh, they had a, a letter that's more of a shape like an X that is pronounced like it's a CH. Um, and so that if you look at the book, you'll discover that there's some, a number of things at the beginning that match things at the end. And then going down, there's things that come next and match things before the end. And so it comes down. And so the core of the book of Revelation, as we will see, is found in Revelation 12 to 14, where there's a major emphasis on the great controversy and all that it implies. 
Now that ought to say something. Well, that's at the bottom of the V is huh? Revelation, what chapter? 12 to 14. Chapters 12 to 14. And that's considered to be the most important part. Okay. Yeah. Now, so the climax goes down? Well. Goes down yeah, and it, then up it, again. Yeah. It, it, you, what we're going to look at is we're going to see historically things that, are, for, from, from our perspective, we're going to see history going like this. Step, I mean, it's, going to, it's going to cover periods and it's going to go again, it's going to do again, and we come down to near the end where we presumably we are now, and he's going to review for us the whole great controversy from the very beginning when Satan rebelled in heaven all the way to the end, and then he's going to show how events in the last short period of time before the end parallel again these things that we've already discussed, and that's a uh, so when people say history repeats, uh, and if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes of history. So it's sort of... Um, it's going to happen in the book of Revelation. It, so history does repeat. Why? <laughs> We're so dumb we make the same mistakes again, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's basically the, the <laughs> truth. I mean, God has a mission, mm -hmm. and he wants something to happen. The devil comes along and inspires us to, to not want that, and we usually respond in the same way, no matter where we're, mm -hmm. where we're ancient history or modern people, we tend to do the same thing with God's words. God's a teacher. It takes a lot of time to repeat. Say what you meant to say. <laughs> That's right. Uh, say it, and then have, tell them what you told them. Well, exactly. you know, the advertisers that sell us stuff, they count on our behavior because they sell us stuff using the same tricks over and over. Yeah, over and over again. Yeah. Red works. Yeah, yeah. it works. It uh, works. Don't you think, though, there's a lot of concepts that do happen when things come together a certain way? We respond um, similarly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Say, well, say that um, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see Bonnie and Clyde or somebody, you know, living by the gun, you can predict that they're going to die by the, the gun. Yeah. So there's, there's all kinds of that kind of thing in it, too. So I'm, I'm going to ask some really important questions right now, and I'd like to hear your response. And then sometime along, as we study through the book of Revelation, if you think you're going to ch want to change your response, that's fine. Speak up. Tell me what you think the average person on the street who maybe has had a little exposure to Christianity, what do they think of the book of Revelation? Well, what did you think about it when you first read it for <laughs> yourself? It Totally confusing. Yeah. I, I think that's the consensus, isn't it? Pretty much. Yeah. I thought it was, m a lot of it was sort of like Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. You know. yeah. 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 Well, many people don't know, have no idea what to do with such a book. And scholars have criticized it for all kinds of reasons, usually because what they think it teaches which may or may not be what it really teaches, it disagrees with something they've already decided on in their minds. Uh, we're going to talk about Martin Luther, who rejected the book of Revelation because it didn't have enough about the gospel as far as he was concerned, um, the fact that Christ died on behalf of you and me. He thought that was the big thing that every book ought to talk about, and if it didn't talk about that, he wanted to throw it out. Did he give up on that? But the was that early in his career, and he, and he modified it later on? Mm, I don't think he ever modified it very much. No. Now, scientists are supposed to think of a theory and then test either test it, prove it, or disprove it. So the, uh, Martin Luther would not want to look at his theory and then test it, or so it's proven or disproven by revelation. It just didn't fit, so he well, tossed it out? Well, he, he had his... He, ha he, he was judging books by a principle he called the Christomonistic principle. That's a, a big, long name from, de derived from Greek that means he wanted to see in every book of the, of the Bible, as far as he was concerned, proof that Christ was number one in that book and that it, it said what he wanted to say about Christ. And this book just says right up front, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, but yeah. it, didn't, it didn't say about Christ what he wanted to say about Christ, so he didn't like it. Well, we've got to remember Martin Luther did a lot of good stuff. Too. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's sure. for sure. Sure. Um, but, and now here's the next big question. 
Seventh-day Adventists have basically based a huge amount of our theology on ideas that have either completely based in the book of Revelation or they've got, we've gotten them from other parts of the Bible, but they part of it at least is from the book of Revelation. I mean, without the book of Revelation, we would lose a great deal. Is that, um, is that reasonable? Are we, are we out on a limb somewhere? Why do we have to ask whether that's reasonable? Because that's just I just fact. did. That's just <laughs> fact. <laughs> well, but I mean, are we being foolish by basing our, our so many beliefs on a book that most people think is incomprehensible? Not well, really, because the book of Revelation comes from the Old Testament mainly, mm -hmm. doesn't it? it? It's a book that folds every part of the Bible into it. It's the, it's the summary book. Yes. So it's not like Revelation is studied in isolation. Mm -hmm. You have to know everything about the Bible. Yes. You know, but I wouldn't get too worried about being in the minority. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> the majority is going to be lost. Re yes. Revelation 13, what, 7? Yeah. The whole world wondered after the beast. Or they Three, worshiped four, the seven, beast. and eight. Four so verses in a row almost. Bottom line, if the masses are going one direction, truth is probably it. back there. Yeah. And well, isn't that thing. one of the ploys of Satan? Yeah. To make us look at other people and say, well, he doesn't believe, he doesn't believe, and, and compare our beliefs with what they believe, as opposed to what Scripture says. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that the Adventist church, along with other Adventists, came from the Millerite movement, and it was based on prophecy. Mm-hmm. So um, prophecy is going to be a big thing with the Adventists, mm -hmm. along with the Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're going to they're going to go that direction. Yeah. Well, so let's now start digging in here a little bit and see if we can see a little bit of the of the milieu, the cultural milieu that this book came out of. Judaism is a monotheistic religion, meaning, meaning there is one supreme God. Now, we would say, Christians will say, well, that's, that includes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jews would tend to say there's just one God, and there's not three parts to that God. When the Jews went into Babylonian captivity, they were, they were sort of tried, the Babylonians tried to force them to become Babylonians, but that was also a more or less monotheistic religion known as Zoroastrianism. But later... Who did, who did the Babylonians uh, worship as their one god? Marduk. Marduk? Yes. As in the dog, Marmaduke? No. <laughs> no, no. Marduk? No, not Marduk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not, no. Marduk. Okay. <laughs> Marduk. But and then there was a period under the, under the uh, Medes and Persians where the Jews were allowed to more or less be independent and do their own practice, their own religious religion. But then came Alexander the Great. And what was his push as he swept across the world all the way from, from Italy to, to uh, India? What was, what, was his, what was he trying to accomplish? And we're gonna, while you're thinking about that, we're about to run out of time before our break. Maybe we have to wait for the answer. Remember, that came about 320 years before Christ. And Alexander had in mind a certain specific thing he wanted accomplished. What was it? We'll see you in a moment.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Alexander the Great thought that everybody should become Greek. He wanted cities to change to be Greek cities. He wanted everybody to speak Greek. He wanted to change the whole world into cultural Greeks. And he, he succeeded to a remarkable extent <laughs> considering the fact that he only survived to age 33. Amazing what he accomplished. Why, why did he want everybody to be Greek? He thought that, that was... was he, he, he just clearly believed that Greek ideas, Greek philosophy... I mean, Socrates was his teacher. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, he, he thought... Uh, no, was it, was it Aristotle or was it Socrates? One or the other. Was, don't remember that right now. Uh, but he had great philosophers who were his teachers. And he, as far as he was concerned, the Greek political system, Greek thinking, the Greek language was way superior to everything else. So if you want to be, you want to advance in the world, become a Greek. That was his idea. And everywhere he went, he wanted to turn the cities into Greek cities. Hmm. Well, that led to a huge conflict in Palestine. Because there were many people in Palestine who said, let's do it. We want, to, we want to be as advanced as the rest of the world. Let's just join the party. Let's become Greek. They, they built a horse racing place in, in, in Jerusalem and, and introduced lots of Greek ideas and so forth. But there were others who said, absolutely not. Uh, we're not going to, that's, the Greek pantheistic religion is not for us. We, we believe in the one true God. And, and so there was right within the... What does pantheism mean? Pantheism or, or, or polytheistic really is more correct is an is a idea that there are many, many different gods. There's a god for this, there's a god, god. for rain, there's a god for sun, yeah. there's a god for animals. Uh, lots of things. They, you've heard of Greek mythology and those Greek gods, they were out there doing all sorts of hanky-panky and marrying human women and, and doing all sorts of stuff. And the Greek gods were sort of humans grown big. Were the Greek gods, I know I, I, in college I studied, I think it was Greek, and it was Greek to me about mythology and stuff. Is that the, like the horse that had the man for the, yeah. the yeah, yeah. Yeah, and lots, lots of things like that, yeah. Okay. W women who have sna snakes for their hair and that kind of stuff. Medusa. Medusa. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So there we now have a monotheistic religion, which was Jewish, the Jewish religion, and it's being attacked basically by a new wave, a new culture, new ideas, including this polytheistic idea that there's all these gods. With an uh, attitude of we're superior and yeah. enlightened. Yeah. Okay. So what makes, what makes you um, judge whether something, uh, a culture is superior than another? Is it, it couldn't be just religion because then everybody would well, argue about that. Yeah. Alexander would say we're superior because we conquered the world. So it was in his case. It wasn't it was, because of the running water, the way they built, built no. um, their architecture, their way of well, thinking. Well, I mean, there's no question about the fact that their artistry, their their sculpture, um, their their buildings were phenomenal, way ahead of probably of the rest of the world in their day. So I mean, he had some reason for thinking what he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, look at what's going on in terms of art and so forth in other parts of the world in those days. I mean, and look at the statues that are left in stone from the Greeks. I mean, they're just about perfect, you know? And they let, that was it, the Parthenon, that lasted until, yeah. what, World War II or something yeah. like that? that it, it, yeah. four, a couple of thousand years. Well, even like today, some of us can think that we have such enlightened, we have all this stuff we know how to do, and we'll go into a, a little backward country and, and, and say we're superior because we have this, 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 and this, and when it really isn't true at all. Yeah. Well, what that led to is a real conflict in ideas. And what arose out of that that's important to us in our discussion of the book of Revelation is what came to be known as apocalyptic literature. From about 200 years before Christ to about 200 years after Christ is a period of time in which apocalyptic literature was written. And apocalyptic literature included a variety of things, but there were 
There were visions that people claimed to have seen. Remember, this is not just the book of Revelation. We're talking about all kinds of other interesting stuff. And it was basically the idea, we're being persecuted now, we're suffering now, but keep a stiff upper lip, try to survive through this because glorious times are ahead. That's largely the emphasis of apocalyptic literature. Did apocalyptic literature usually have the chiasm format? No. No, no. Now, could it be that Satan and his demons knew there was something going to happen and they started getting busy with uh, with uh, inspiring this literature 200 years before Christ to 200 years after to yeah. kind of muddy the waters? Sure. So describe what this literature is as opposed to the normal stuff. Well, I mean, read read Romans and compare Revelation. I mean, so if you're talking about... that kind of, that kind of, that it's cryptic, is that it's one cryptic, thing? It's cryptic, it's filled with visions where the author just says, whoa, you know, I don't hardly even know how to describe what I'm seeing. In the Old Testament, uh, there was sort of precursors to that in Ezekiel, for example, but it's not, not really apocalyptic. Daniel, maybe a little bit of Daniel, some kinds of stuff, just hints but um, basically it happened during this 400-year this period. The Greek culture, maybe like our culture, or maybe in the 60s, do you think they were dabbling in things like LSD and getting these <laughs> no. visions? And, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> I think most of the stuff that was written as apocalyptic literature was just thought up in somebody's head. Well, do you, do you believe in visions? Do you believe in? Well, yeah, I, I, I but I think exactly that, what happens in a vision. Is it is it something where people go wacko, or is it? Well, um, of course, there are people who have visions who are wacko, and that's mm -hmm. part of the problem. But there are people who literally see things which are given to them from God. Visions. They see something in vision, and then they they're, they're stuck with the task of trying to describe, in the best language they can, what they saw. Paul describes his his activities, what happened to him, as kind of a narrative of, of what goes on. Isn't that what the author's trying to do after they've seen whatever it is they've seen, try to tell the world what went on? Yeah, but whereas Paul talks about his personal experiences that all, all of us could have, could have seen mm -hmm. if we were there, John, in the book of Revelation, is talking about something that's, I mean, he's looking at heaven, and he sees into the throne, he sees, sees God on his throne in heaven, he, he sees into the holy place, and then into the most holy place, and he sees stuff all over the place that the rest of us could never see. So if an author is, is describing fantastic things that he has seen that nobody else has seen, that's apocalyptic as opposed to somebody writing about history? Yes. Well, okay. To a certain extent, yes. Well, let me ask you something else. If a person is in vision, and he's seen all these things, is he going to be the one that's going to be the most um, authoritative as far as finding what the meaning is? Probably. Why would you say that? Well, because presumably he has a visual picture of what he saw in his I mind. I know. He's, he's the expert of what he saw, but yeah. what about the meaning? Because... If you read some of these people that are in, in visions, they don't know what they're seeing. The angel has to explain it to them. And, and then you think, about, you think about Nebuchadnezzar. He saw all kinds of things, and he had no clue what he saw. He needed somebody to tell him what it was. Yeah, sure. Same with the... I think what you're describing is part of the, of the notion of inspiration. Inspiration by God because he can tell one person something, they have no idea what they're seeing, but later on he gives a, a, a message to somebody else that explains that, and all of a sudden there's, there's harmony and things that goes on. That's part of the unfolding of the message as God provides it. Yeah, I see that. I guess my point is that just because a person sees the vision doesn't, doesn't mean he's necessarily the best person to know what the the meaning of it is, yeah. uh, not that's all the time. It's not every time, sure. Yeah. That's right. I mean, the perfect example of that is Daniel, where God finally says, seal up the book. 
And one time, one of the visions, Daniel was so perplexed by what he saw, he was sick for a couple right. of weeks. He said, you know, I was just completely baffled. And it seemed like the angel, angel was trying to make a point was, don't you know these things? And he says, well, yeah. tell me, yeah. you know, so. Now, the vision, a vision can be true, a vision can be from just a crackpot or whatever. Yeah. And you tell, the proof is in the pudding, you tell how substantial the vision is by over time it's tested. Mm -hmm. So over time revelation was tested and that's why it's in the Bible. Yes. Well, not only that, but you can go through the Bible very quickly and, and check it out. Yeah. There's, that can happen. One of the things that uh, makes revelation very interesting to study is the idea through the Bible and here's a place where we would like to put the book of Daniel alongside the book of Revelation. As you go through the Bible, you'll discover there are times when a prophecy will be made, and maybe it has a local application. And then, later, it has a much greater application, but the, 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 the circumstances, the, the general picture is the same, but it's made on a larger scale. So, and, and a perfect example of that is found in Isaiah 7 to 9. If you read those chapters very carefully, you'll realize that in, in a modern version particularly, that this is, a, this is a prophecy about Isaiah and his wife having a child and, and uh, the, the, forces, the forces from Assyria and the northern kingdom of Israel attacking Judah from the north. And, and Isaiah is told, don't worry. Uh, they're going to be, those people are going to be gone before your child grows up and he's old enough to say mommy and daddy. But it ends up in, Revel I mean in Isaiah 9 by saying, and a, a certain son is going to be born, and that son is going to be what? Everlasting Father, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, and the government will be on his shoulders forever and ever. I mean, that's not Isaiah's son. There's no way that can possibly apply to Isaiah's son. Now, what does that have to do with the book of Revelation? Well, there are prophecies that seem to have local Im implications and long-term. Uh, one of the first ones we're going to look at when we get to Revelation 2 and 3, we're going to see that there are probably three fulfillments of those prophecies to the seven churches. There was probably a local fulfillment to the churches in those days that had meaning to them. Then there was a prophecy, a, a fulfillment that spreads across the ages from their day until ours. And then we're going to see that some of those prophecies have very specific implications for events that happen at the end of this world. Another one of those is when Jesus mixed his discussion and description of the fall of Jerusalem yes. to the end of time. Matthew 24, Matthew Mark 13, 24, and 21. Yeah. Yeah. Usually something happens, like with Daniel and with uh, John. Uh, they said they fell down as if dead, mm -hmm. and then the angel come and speaks with him. So many people think it's just a dream. Mm -hmm. It's a fabricated dream, uh, vision. It's just something the mind just conjures up. What do we say to that? Modern physicians have said that those kinds of things are temporal lobe seizures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, not only that, but they said People have said it, that on the island of Patmos, there's, there are some mushrooms there mm. that, that um, people can... Yeah, yeah can, listen to yeah. it fizz. Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, the thing is that this is not something, something from a person just having hallucinations. There's just too much structure. Yeah. There's too much... Um, people said that the five books of Moses came because Moses ate some mushrooms too. I mean, how many mushrooms yeah. does it take to make a Bible? <laughs> how con convoluted would it be if you, they did use mushrooms? Yeah. You know, it'd be all over the place. Yeah. There's some other yeah. religious word writings that can take that description. You know. yeah. Does it say in the Bible that God gives visions? Yes. Yes. He reveals himself to his, pro his servants, pro the prophets. Mm -hmm. Uh, Amos 3, 7, Deuteronomy vision, 29. Mm -hmm. Visions, does it say any other way? Well, it talks about other ways. Dreams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Visions and dreams, Joel 2. And his mm -hmm. friends, he speaks face to face. Yeah. yeah. 
but his friends he speak face to face. Such as uh, Moses. Moses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But people don't believe visions still happen, and they do. And I believe people who have them are kind of don't want to say they have them because people will go, oh my God, you're crazy. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah. Well, <coughs> there's another phenomenon that we need to understand here that's, that should temper, or, or, well, let's say at least should have some impact on our understanding of the book of Revelation. If you look at the Old Testament, and if you could somehow block from your mind everything you know from the New Testament and try to focus on just the Old Testament, you will discover that nobody in the Old Testament had any idea that there was going to be more than one coming of the Messiah. They believed that the Messiah was going to come one time, and everything we know, his, his, you know, his eternal power and all that kind of stuff, that was all going to happen at that first coming. Then if we come over to the New Testament where the, where the first coming has already happened and Jesus is now uh, dead and, and, and raised to, back to life and gone to heaven, they say the New Testament all focuses on what's going to happen at the second coming. So they say first coming, this is the things that happened at the first coming, and here are the things that are going to happen at the second coming. It isn't until we get to the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 20 and forward, and the book of Revelation, that there's any notion that there's going to be a millennium, a thousand years, and a third coming. Thank God he didn't quit with chapter 17. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So here we have a situation where the first coming happens. There's at least 2,000 years between the first coming and the second coming, and there's another 1,000 years between the second coming and the third coming, but God, for whatever reason, someday we'll be able to ask Him, just sort of telescopes those things together for the people back in the Old Testament. They all happen, because there's, there are some prophecies in the Old Testament, for example, in Zechariah, that we say, oh yeah, that's going to happen at the third coming. But Zechariah had no notion whatsoever that there even was going to be a third coming. So, and then we come to the New Testament, and here we have everything in the second coming and the third coming. Paul sort of puts the second and third coming. If you look at 2 Thessalonians, he just puts them together. He thinks all those things are going to happen, second, third coming, at the coming of the Messiah. And, and he doesn't have any notion that there's going to be a second coming and then a third coming. You know, I, can, I can understand the second coming because Jesus came first time and then he left. So mm -hmm. he's got to come back. Yeah. So the third coming, did Jesus leave again? Well, yes, he does. Yeah, yeah he leaves. At he the leaves. second coming, he, he, takes, he takes the righteous and he takes them to heaven for a thousand years. Yeah, but I'm talking about the, um, the people that he takes. Does he leave them? No, but he leaves this earth. It, it, the, the but picture. there's nobody on the earth. Oh, yes, there is. Satan and all his angels. Well, I'm talking about people. No, we're talking about the great controversy, so we have to include Satan. Okay, I guess if you want to define it that way, Didn't that'll Jesus work. Didn't Jesus even say um, that I can't tell you everything, you yes. can't, you, yeah. your mind can't hold John it, it would blow your mind. And so God is like um, giving us as much as we can take. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, if God had told the people in the Old Testament, this is going to happen, and it's going to take this long, uh, they might have got discouraged and uh, wouldn't want to have done stuff as, as if they thought it was going to be happening sooner or something mm -hmm. like that. It doesn't take long for humans to get discouraged. Mm -hmm. Israelites yeah. get, got discouraged in, in less than 40 days. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's so much discouragement's a problem. I think it's just because how can he explain it? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the early times, it's just hard to explain. You have to let things go by a little bit so there's more to talk about to be able to separate those things. We mentioned earlier in our broadcast that Martin Luther rejected the book of Revelation. Were there other books he rejected? Do you remember? Yeah, he didn't like Hebrews. He no. didn't like Hebrews? Jude. James, Jude. And Second Peter. Second Peter. So, if you include Revelation, there are five books that Martin Luther said no. I, I, and he put them. He didn't get rid of them completely. He put them at the end. He didn't number them as part of his New Testament. He made a kind of New Testament apocrypha out of those five books, because once again, what was his criteria? Christomonistic principle. The Christomonistic principle. He wanted, he wanted every book of the Bible to focus on how Christ saves you and me.
That's the big thing. And if it doesn't talk about that, I don't care what else it talks about, you know, it, it's, it doesn't meet the criteria. Well, at least he's honest about it. Mm -hmm. You know how he's got things lined up. But the book of Revelation does explain how Christ saves you and me. Well, but not the way Martin Luther wanted it to. Which brings, that's precisely my and point. And Jude said how Christ saves you and me. That's precisely my point. The, the, what, what was Martin Luther doing? He was using his own theories, his own mind, to judge Scripture. Is that way the way we're supposed to do things? What would happen if everybody did that? What do you well, mean by each, what we've got now? Every person yeah. would have yeah. their favorite two little books of the Bible, and um, well, that would be it. I, I don't understand the question. Okay. Well, Martin Luther set up his criteria, the ideas that were important to him, and he says, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... And he went through a lot of books, and he started throwing out them, books. And he, he partially threw out these books we're talking about, and the book of, including the book of Revelation we're going to talk about here, because he didn't like the way they presented their message. They didn't agree with him. So his, his main criteria is you've got to agree with me, otherwise you don't, you don't belong in the Bible. Now, there was a lot of writings around... Mm -hmm. during that time, even before that, where, where a lot of people at the early Christian church had to wade through all this stuff, mm -hmm. they had to come up with some sort of criteria to start yes. filtering them out. Mm -hmm. So and it and looks like, did. I know they did, but um, I don't see too much difference in between that and what, what, they did. What, what they did, as long as the criteria is out there. Mm -hmm. um, you might disagree with the criteria, but um, at least my, he's honest about it. My concern is, do we judge the Bible or do we allow the Bible to guide us? That's, that was my question. But wasn't the Bible kind of iffy, what, what, what well, exactly it was yet? That's exactly what we want to talk about next. And we're not going to have time to finish that today, but we'll talk about that next week more. How do we decide, particularly when a book like Revelation has been attacked from so many corners and so many critics and so forth like this, what is the basis on which we decide, yes, this book is solid, it belongs in the New Testament, we can build doctrine on it, we can, we can trust that it was, it's what it says it is. I, I think we need to have some pretty solid, let's nail this down, let's look at the evidence to decide that, yes, this book can be trusted. Well, all the people that did put Revelation in the Bible, why did they do it? And that's the question w which we need to focus on. It's kind of like, we've got the answers, because we've got the books in the Bible. Now, let's figure out what the question is. What, did, what, what logic did they use to put them there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And do we have any idea what that is? Well, yeah, we do. Uh, one of the main criteria at least in the early stages of putting the, the New Testament together, we won't talk about the Old Testament right now, but the main criteria in the early stages of putting together the New Testament was, was it written by one of the immediate followers of Jesus Christ? Mm. Was it written by a disciple? Or maybe one of the apostles, for example, Paul, would be recognized as one of the major apostles. So if it wasn't written by one of those people, you know, immediately it, it's suspect. So... Then, so we then have to ask ourselves, okay, is, do we have solid evidence to suggest that the book of Revelation was written by one of the disciples? Mm -hmm. What is that evidence? Is it, is it reliable evidence? So those are the kind of things we're going to look at, and we'll, we'll pick that up next time. Some of you may want to look at this evidence in a little more depth than we just listening to us in these one-hour presentations. The handout which we use uh, here to in our discussions on the book of Revelation and for that matter all the other books of the Bible is available on our website. The website is theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, Theological Crossroads or theox dot O-R-G and you will be able to find this evidence there and, and it, will, it will lead you on, it will point to other places you can, you can go to get additional information. So having said that, what have we seen? What have we learned about the book of Revelation so far? Evidence, we, have, we believe that we have evidence. We're going to look at it in more detail that John was the one who wrote it. 
We believe he wrote it from the Isle of Patmos. He was in basically in prison on the Isle of Pat Patmos. We have jokingly suggested that uh, he didn't have too good secretarial help out there. There are some there are some grammatical errors and so forth in the book of Revelation. That doesn't mean there's anything seriously wrong with the book of Revelation. It's just grammatical stuff and so forth that anybody could figure out if you know a little bit of Greek that this was a mistake here. We also know that it was a time of terrible persecution that this book that led to the writing of this book. They had thrown John into a pot of boiling oil and he didn't cook. So the same people who threw him in had to dig him back out again. And so the Emperor Domitian decided that, okay, I'll take care of him by exiling him to the Isle of Patmos. We have suggested without spending a lot of time on it that, that later when Domitian died, the next Roman Emperor released John and all the other prisoners from the Isle of Patmos to go back. And he went back to Ephesus, which had been his major home, main home for a long period of time. And from there he he went on to ministering to the churches in Asia Minor. So we can see how, we, we will see how the book of Revelation fits into all of that and how it's appropriate. We've suggested that the book of Revelation is a part of apocalyptic literature. The apocalyptic literature was particularly prominent, prominent from about 200 BC to about 200 AD. Um, and this literature included things like visions and so forth. And we're, we will look at those to try to ask, okay, is this just somebody's pipe dream or is this reliable information from God? That's the kind of stuff we really want to know. And uh, we'll, we'll try to explore that possibility. Could it be that John, as some people have suggested, ate some poisonous mushrooms and all this stuff was just hallucinations? And I think we'll, we'll be able to demonstrate very clearly that that is not the case. There's a very clear pattern in this book. It says some very important things that we need to know about. It guides us all the way in events that will, will, will be spread out all the way from John's day to the end of the history of our world and on into the millennium and on into the, the recreating, really, of the new heavens and the new earth where we will all have all of those of us who agree with John and, and join Jesus Christ We'll have homes in what will be the future Garden of Eden. Hope you'll join us next week as we continue. See you then.